Welcome to the next session uh, from Vogue, Valley of Votes. Now my request, uh, Sri ELS and Bala Prasad sir to be the moderator. So may I welcome you sir onto the dais sir, please. It's about Loki Takes God by Menaka Raman. And Miss Manya Mishra is joining online and also Miss Menaka Raman is also joining online. And my, my request to Professor Vedasharan sir uh, in place of Professor Matthew John sir. Thank you sir, thank you. So I request the moderator, ELS and Bala Prasad sir, IAS retired, to take us through the session, sir. You have two panelists online waiting for you, sir, and uh, Professor Vesh Sharan Sarli is Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, good morning, uh, friends. Uh, good morning, Ms. Raman, online. And hi, Manya. Uh, we have... We are old classmates, so it's a rather informal session we are going to have today. Uh, to begin with, let me say that uh, Mrs. Raman, you must have had a great amount of fun writing this book, because this book uh, is chirpy, bright, full of sunshine, you know, it, that sort of thing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, people watching this online and uh, an eclectic, eclectic audience here. Would you like to briefly highlight some of the main things you would want them to understand or follow so that you know, they're all, we're all on the same page? Otherwise, it'll be a conversation between you and us three, OK? Sure, absolutely. Uh, just quickly, everyone can hear me all right before I continue? You're good. You're good. Okay. okay. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me uh, and for also making my book Loki Takes Guard a part of the Valley of Words Festival. Um, so Loki Takes Guard is a book for young adults, though I have to say I've also had lots of young at heart adults read the book and enjoy it in the year that it's come out in. It's about a young 11-year-old uh, girl called Lokanayaki who lives in Madras, um, you know, with her parents, her brother and grandparents, and she's cricket crazy. Uh, she's partly inspired by a, one of my best friends in school um, who is completely obsessed with the game and could have long, long conversations about cricket with anyone and everyone. And she desperately wants to play cricket uh, for her local league team called the Temple Street Tankers. Uh, but Loki is unfortunately turned away once she turns 11 and told that this is a boys only team and we possibly can't have any girls uh, come and play on this team. So you have to you have to leave. You can't come and train with us. You can't play with us. And initially, Loki kind of, you know, takes it. And because, you know, when when grownups tell young children that you can and can't do this, they tend to believe them and say, OK, I can't do this means I can't do this. But she's quite fortunate that she meets a neighbor of hers called Malati and uh, Malati Akka, uh, is uh, kind of tells her, you know, you don't have to take what other people tell you that you can and can't do, and you can go ahead and change things for yourself. So why don't you try? And she gives her an idea to start a petition, which is what Loki does. So petition, uh, Loki makes this petition and she tries to get people in her neighborhood and in her house to, to sign it. And basically the petition says, you know, just give me a chance. That's all I'm asking for. I just want a chance to try and play for your team. And, uh, she finds support in some, you know, unlikely corners in her neighborhood. She doesn't get much support from her home because she lives in a fairly traditional kind of, you know, setup. Uh, and her mother famously tells her, you know, you should become an accountant or something like that. Why, why do you want to be a cricketer? Because there's, there's, that's just a pipe dream. And, you know, one thing leads to another and suddenly Loki finds that her petition has gone online. Someone has put it up online and it goes viral. And soon that takes on a life of its own, this petition. And she's soon featured in, uh, you know, online. She's in the media. She's in the papers. Uh, and again, not everyone is happy with that. And it leads to some kind of difficulty for Loki as well with certain, you know, friends and, and family members. And it's really what happens after this. So what happens when you want something, uh, you're working towards something, and then it kind of takes on a life of its own and, and maybe a little bit goes out of control. And, uh, of course, you have to read the book to find out if for the team or not. So I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? 
Yes, now I can. Yeah. Mrs. Menka Raman is based in Bangalore. She's also had a career trajectory which is pretty interesting, starting off as a software engineer, moving on to copyright ads and uh, journalism, and also now writing for children, right? That's but uh, you also have been a writer as a, as a youngster from your bio, it seems. So your trajectory has been very interesting. It's as if you know, you've been finding out what's your purpose from software to copyright to journalism and then finally to writing books. So here it is. This book uh, is uh, uh, it's a happy coincidence that you know, we're talking about this book today, Children's Day. Uh, while it is about a young child, 11-year-old child, but it's not only for children. And the other thing is today is the 2020 World Cup final. So it's about cricket too. So two interesting things and uh, I guess you've woven a very nice picture of, uh, of your Temple Street, you know, recreating something like Malgudi in there. So I would now request my colleague, Professor Veda Sharan, uh, to take over because as an English professor, I think he's more qualified to find out the nuances and highlight them better. Manya is already online. I don't know if you can see her. Yes. Hi. So, Professor Ved Sharan. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, it's been a, a fantastic experience going through this book. Uh, and I really thoroughly enjoyed uh, every page of, uh, of the book. And uh, uh, I must say that uh, it's, it's as uh, uh, our moderator Balasa was pointing out, it's not just for children, but adults can read it with a lot of profit <coughs> and uh, enjoyment as well. So it appeals both to, as Bacon says, uh, the business and bosoms of all people. Anyway, um, I think I met Mania sometime uh, before, and I know her very well. Uh, and yes. ma'am, it's a privilege to meet you, the author. Uh, and uh, I must thank you for a very delightful book. Uh, as, a, as an academician and as a professor, you must forgive me for being a little pedantic and going by the rules. Uh, when I teach reading in the classroom, uh, I always ask my students to look at the cover design. Many people say that you should not judge a cover, a book by its cover. And I think it, it cuts both ways. <laughs> that the uh, cover could be bad and the contents could be good. And the other side of the story, the other 50% is that the contents are bad, but the cover is very good. So either way, um, but I think this, uh, this cover design here has been done very professionally. And um, uh, it shows the vigor of the character there in the swinging bat. Uh, the background, I think, is uh, very varied. And uh, uh, I think the houses and everything that are, are very typical of, of the Indian scene. And I think I must congratulate the cover designer for doing a very good job. Uh, and um, there are many issues here that the book raises, which are very important and very sensitive. And that way, I think, um, it's something that uh, we would like the author to come back to as we go along uh, in, the, in the thing. Ma'am, first as a language teacher, I would I like to ask um, Ms. Raman to speak about uh, the language in the, the mimicry that you could carry out in the, uh, in the novel that you could so beautifully and accurately mimic the language of a child the language of an Indian, and um, the language of the game itself. Uh, would you like to say something about this? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I just, before I do start, I want to just mention that the cover design was illustrated by a very fantastic illustrator called Ekta Bharti, and the design is by Maitri D, who works with Speaking Tiger. She's the art director. So full credit to them and to my editors at Speaking Tiger for this wonderful cover, which I do love. Coming to your uh, question about language, um, I think this was my first attempt at writing a book for this age group, uh, you know, which is about say 11 
plus, maybe 11, 12 plus and, and above. And it's a hard age group to, um, I think, to write for. Because if you're, you know, when you talk about language and that ear for that, that tone of voice of young people in this age group, if you're trying too hard to be cool or trying too hard to sound like them, I think they can they can smell that a mile away. I think this is an extremely discerning, uh, you know, I think all children as readers are very discerning. They know immediately what they like, what they don't like, uh, what they respond to. And I think in this age group, they can be very, very vocal. So I think my biggest uh, thing throughout was, okay, I have to make sure that it sounds like them, but at no point should any reader in this particular age group think, oh, this is, you know, this is an auntie trying to be cool. So I think I was very, very, um, you know, aware of that. I think for me, I'm really lucky. I have uh, two children at home, one who's now 10 and one who's 13. They were about maybe eight, nine and, you know, 11 when I was writing the book. So I'm, our house is constantly filled with their conversations, their conversations with their friends. When they come back and they talk to me at the, you know, before COVID, of course, uh, they would tell me about their school day and when I would go and, you know, meet their friends. So I'm in that sense, kind of almost enveloped throughout the day in, in the way they speak, in, in their reactions, in the way they look at certain situations. So I think I was very fortunate that I was able to, you know, I was able to have that around me. I won't lie, I do eavesdrop sometimes, you know, on purpose, <laughs> just to kind of, you know, get a sense of their world. I think that's really important to have a sense of the world of these young people, you know, and, and how they feel, how they think, um, and their opinions. So I think that's really, really important to kind of keep that in mind. And at no point, try and talk down to them, or try and over explain things to them, or kind of be pedantic. So and of course, I don't think any of those that those approaches would have worked with the story line of this book. Uh, with respect to the setting of the book, um, you know, so the it's it's something that I all you know I grew up in in Madras with the kind my my friends, the school I went to, you know, their homes, my friends' homes, their neighborhoods, and even you know my own street where everyone kind of knew what was happening in, in each other's lives, whether you liked it or not. And how everyone felt a certain, uh, the Tamar word for it is urime, this almost like uh, this, um, they were allowed to have an opinion about, you know, who you were, what you were doing, what you wore, um, what your aspirations were, and felt no qualms kind of sharing that information with you either, whether you liked it or not. So mm -hmm. that kind of uh, feeling and, you know, that ambience also I wanted to try and recreate and that community. Uh, you know, around uh, in a in a neighborhood like that, I really really wanted to uh, communicate. So yeah, I think those two things were, uh, and I'm and I hoped as I was writing it that the book managed to pull that off and carry it off throughout. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think there's something much uh, a lot beyond what you have said about the language that you have achieved a lot of uh, humor through slapstick, for example. Uh, with the thumping and all that. Uh, I think that was a very interesting kind of stuff. And then uh, you have a lot of nonce words like bendy and so on, uh, which I think are very relevant and make a lot of sense in that uh, bendy asana. So I think that's a very yeah, vivid yeah. description of, uh, of what is happening there. Uh, I thought this was a very uh, nice thing that you, that you did. Uh, coming back to the name of the character, uh, the first half is, of course, Norse, Norse mythology, and together it makes the leader of the world. I think in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere joined up in the name together. Uh, so Loki is the god of mischief and is very cunning. Uh, and I think um, in the movie Mask, uh, Loki figures a lot. I think um, starring Jim Carrey, I think it's very popular popular movie and there I think Jim Carrey does a lot of stuff six too in, in, in the in the stuff. So um, would you like to say something about what inspired you to take to give this name to your central character? So um, Loki is is not a in, in the book. The character Loki is not a mischief maker in the sense of she's not uh, she's not really a mischief maker in the sense of you know Loki the Norse god. But her actions do cause problems for other people, you know, uh, inadvertently. Uh, and I think she feels bad about yeah, it. I meant, I meant mischief in a nice way, not just... In, in a, a way, nice way. Yes, absolutely. But I think I like... Uh, so the... 
you know, I think the interesting thing was that she had a, a very traditional name and she comments on it very early on in the book as well. Loka Nayaki is an extremely traditional name that you don't see given very often to children. But once in a while, you'll have a name like that come up. And she's kind of shortened it as, you know, people are want to do to make it sound a little cooler and sound, uh, you know, more acceptable amongst her peers and possibly to herself. Uh, I I really uh, appreciate that you know that Loki and Nayaki and that combination. I have to admit that wasn't there in my mind when I came up with it, but that's really lovely that you you've kind of uh, seen it that way. For me, I think we had an. Uh, I remember when my sister had a baby and we, she was thinking of names. One of the names my mother came up was with. You know, you should call her Loki Nayaki, and you can call her Lashot. <laughs> And I don't know, I mean, my sister, of course, did not choose that name. She went uh, another direction. But that name always stayed with me. Loka Nayaki is a very powerful, you know, it's a very powerful name. It's imbued with a lot of power. Um, but at the same time, I, it's interesting that when parents give names like that to their children, so you've named your daughter Loka Nayaki, but you would like her to kind of shrink in and not embody the power of her name. You'd like her to fit in. You'd like her to, you know, do, do not stand out, not be, you know, all that she can be. So I found that very interesting. And of course, this Loki and then the little bits of mischief and all of that, it just kind of came together for me. Oh, I'll make just one more point. I don't know if you intended it or not. Uh, we have what we call this intentional fallacy where the writer's opinion is not available to the learner, to the reader at the time of reading. So you are free to make whatever meaning that you want out of yeah. the out of the text, whether the writer intended that or not. So we don't know why Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. So um, I was also reminded of uh, Aristophanes' drama Lysistrata. Uh, the word Lysistrata means the defeater of enemies. And uh, if you remember the play, uh, Lysistrata gathers all the women around her uh, to go on a sex strike to force the men to stop fighting. and. Uh, the way she has to keep those, uh, you know, very lustful women from going home back is a huge, is a very funny situation in the drama. And I think in many ways, the way Loki manipulates people around her, tries to bring them into her, uh, into her, into supporting her and so on, is, is, is in some ways I thought reminiscent of this drama. So I was also thinking about, uh, I don't know if you would agree with this or not, uh, Margaret Mead's book, Coming of Age in Samoa, I think um, uh, Loki achieves a menage very early on in the, in the novel. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right. And um, right. I think in, uh, in Coming of Age in Samoa, uh, Mead is talking about how this menage is a very uh, seamless process for the Samoan girls. But... Uh, for the American, uh, for the U.S. girls, it's a very traumatic experience. Uh, but um, I think it's a very similar thing that happens. And is it, and the way they culturally celebrate it in India, and but also there's a sense of shame about it now coming in. Um, I was also thinking about uh, this very rather hilarious essay by uh, Gloria Steinem, uh, which is called "If Men Could Menstruate." And uh, it opens with uh, a woman on a stage making a speech and her skirt becomes red. And I think a similar thing happens here in the, uh, in the novel. Uh, am I right in, in uh, drawing these parallels? I'd like you to respond to that. That's right. Um, so I have to admit that these wonderful kind of other pieces of work that you've mentioned, uh, I haven't read them. <laughs> and uh, it's wonderful that you're able to make those connections with this book. There's one thing a lot of young girls, uh, you know, who have read the book and reviewed it and then kind of reached out to me through their parents or us their parents, a lot of them wanted to know why I included Loki getting her first period in this book. Like why they're in this book. I think some of them were very... Um, some of them were very, most of them actually were quite happy to see that, that it's there in the story. And my answer to them was, because that's what happens. <laughs> you, you know, you become 11 or 12, and if you're a girl, you get it, and it's part of life. And, you know, there is a lot of, there's so many kind of things into it. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of cultural meaning attached to it. And as you rightly said, in India, in many kind of 
he's a girl's first period celebrated it's the cause to have a big function and all of that so there are a lot of cultural and religious kind of connotations around that um then there's a lot of um pop culture and you know so feelings around it as well how getting your periods are portrayed you know she says that as well look he's like you know this is wonderful i've got my periods does it mean i can now wear white shorts and jump over puddles and be this you know wonderful new version of myself uh you know so there's this whole thing of what it means and how your periods can make you this you know i don't know very shiny happy version of yourself you use a particular kind of sanitary pad so while all of this is there the celebration and all of that the other side of it as you said is that there is a lot of taboos around menstruation in india and in a lot of families and a lot of communities it means that you know you shouldn't sit here you shouldn't do that you shouldn't all of these things around it um which are very problematic and again it's it's almost like your that transition you're no longer a child you're no longer seen as a child when you actually are you're still a child but if you've got new periods you're suddenly you know uh, imbued with all these other connotations of womanhood so all of this is happening and all of this comes with its restrictions it comes with you know certain problems how people view you how you're expected to view yourself and at the same and it's all you know this is your body you know being a certain way but that same body also wants to go out and play sports it also wants to go out and play cricket and dance and just be itself um so you need was important to say that just because this has happened to her because she's gotten her periods it's not like loki has to give up her dreams it's not like she has to kind of she self censors herself in certain ways though the rest of society would like to hmm. and i think it was important for you know to have that in that book just to also show this is a part of life it's there you know we should all just kind of not put anything on hold or not listen to anyone else's opinions of what we can and cannot do because now this is a part of our life and other things should be able to continue please manya if you want to ask just raise your finger and we'll bring you in yeah. i have i have two issues before we go switch to manya uh one uh, you said you tried hard not to be a cool auntie you know not to be found out <laughs> now can you <laughs> explain on that it's a bit fascinating how do you try not to be a cool auntie you know and uh, appear to be addressing an audience uh, of that age and second we have a bunch of youngsters sitting here you may not see them directly but yes we have a lot of bunch of youngsters would you like to explain or highlight some of the issues the the the, the things you had to look into or think about when you're writing this genre because writing for kids or writing for youngsters is not easy it's actually more difficult in my in my opinion than writing for adults because you don't have to be anything like a cool person or the other way so these two if you can briefly uh mention or say something especially for a young audience it will be of use and then manya will take over i think she has a question in her mind sure so i think uh one reason why i worried about that a lot is because the book is written in the first person so not only was i you know writing this as an omnipresent narrator or you know as a third person but i'm i'm actually taking on the voice of this young person um so i think when i say cool auntie i mean that you know sometimes uh there's you know, as a parent <laughs> even as i'm a parent to two young boys uh you're always trying to sneak some kind of a, a you know a lesson or a learning or a you know some kind of moral agenda almost sometimes into certain conversations right or when that i have with my children for example and my kids will know like amma are you going to give us a lecture now are you going to are you like easing into this conversation in this friendly haha nice way but are you actually going to deliver us a lecture and they know it and then that's my signal to okay i need to stop now so i think similarly when you're writing a book for um you know for children of any age i think it's very tempting sometimes to want to give them a lesson to want to teach them to teach them something to give them a lesson to give them you know some learning um and you might try and possibly couch that or cover that up with lingo and cool words and you know settings and situations but like i said i think our readers are extremely perceptive they're very very bright and they can smell it a mile away so i think for me that was very important uh the book does deal with um 
you know there are there's there's taboos around menstruation there's caste and class that comes into it there's gender that comes into it there's our attitudes towards you know divorced people uh, especially women divorced women in society that comes to it um so for me it was very important that in all of these things i just present that that situation and say here this is this is this is the conversation that's what happening and not then through loki try and give some some kind of a moral judgment or a, a judgment or a passing as this kind of you know adult behind this young child writing the story it was just to kind of present these situations present these moments and then let the reader make of it whatever they chose to so i think cool auntie was you know i'm cool but i'm also kind of going to reveal my age a bit and try and teach you something because i think so i wanted to avoid that definitely um the second question uh sorry could you repeat the second question sir youngsters here i think uh, yes. some of them may share your passion for writing so would you like to say something that excites them or takes them on their trajectory of their career absolutely uh, i think two things if you want to uh, for you know if you're if you want to be a writer or if you love writing and enjoy writing one is to read widely and read as much as you can read what you like I think that's so important for young readers especially is to be able to have agency and choice in the books that they read. So um and at the same time it's always good to kind of read things which challenge some of your notions and opinions uh as well a bit. So read in your comfort zone but also push yourself a bit to read outside that. And I think write what you want to read. I think the thing is always write the book that you want to read. If you go to a bookstore or if you go to your local library and you're looking for a particular kind of story and you can't find it, write it. and write it for yourself first of all never try and write for um, for you know there's so much advice out there that this is how to get published this is the kind of book to write and all that but i would say first of all write for yourself and enjoy writing i think uh, so mentioned that i must have enjoyed writing this book i have to admit that i did it was uh, it took over a period of 2 years for me to write the first draft i'm a slow writer but at night of time Did I ever get bored with what I was writing? I always the story just made me so happy when I was writing it, and to be able to tell her story just gave me great joy. So, write the books you want to read and write them for yourself first of all. Yeah, it does show that you enjoyed the book writing it. Manya, your question? Yes, sure, sir. Um, first of all, ma'am, congratulations on having published such a beautiful book. I think it's wonderful to have read this beautiful copy of Floki, and I got my copy I think a month back. when uh, i was told that i have to uh, share the screen with you and it's beautiful to have come across with this story um and reading such a genre which is uh, totally different from what we as literature students do read so uh, yeah and uh, moving on to the question and what you just said i think that a feeling of belongingness and the need uh, for acceptance is very important in teenagers and also preteens um, to feel happier and more positive about themselves and basically to have a healthy mental health so uh, because today's children's day and we must talk about children and it's a children's novel so uh, do you think that loki's alienness and the fact that she stood apart from others all the time in the novel and the deeper parts of it would have affected or would affect a child of that age group in general uh, in ways more than one absolutely absolutely i think um well i think you know children are always trying to find a sense of belonging uh, a sense of acceptance you know amongst their peers a family extended family uh, and that's so important that sense of and uh, and a sense of safety in those spaces as well the fact that you can be who you are you don't have to hold back certain parts of yourself and your friends and family accept you entirely um and that's interesting because i didn't really touch upon that in the novel like at no point do we go into uh loki's mental health in that sense and how she is you know how it's affecting her because she's presenting a fairly um you know she's quite defiant in the face of all this even when yeah. things go out of control and, and don't really go her way and she's in trouble and stuff like that she's still kind of willing to see that through and and you know and kind of okay fine let's see what happens now but i do think for a lot of children um increasingly especially with just how much children are now getting on social media you know we have 11 and 12 year olds with their instagram accounts and things like that we now famously know that instagram is 
not good for the mental health and well-being of teenagers, especially young teenage girls. So I have to say, yes, all of these things do take a toll, which is why I think it's so important for teachers at school, educators, right. parents, um, and other kind of adults who are, you know, in a child's life to, to keep an eye open for some of these things and to have these conversations, even if a child is not um, maybe presenting as, as having certain kind of uh, anxieties or worries or things like that, but to always have that conversation and also for them to know that they can come and talk to you about, right. you know, however they're feeling at that point of time. But I do think absolutely there's a tremendous amount of stress and pressure on our young people today. Yes, ma'am. I think um, that's very important also, and especially that brings, uh, I mean, uh, to my next question that, you know, you have beautifully portrayed the beginning of the menstrual cycle. And like we talked about it uh, in the first section of the um, part here and I think that uh, of the Loki in book and this change is totally new for her so based on this do you think that you know when we talk about a child's psychology and then a girl who's 11 years of age and who has already had so much of now to think and go through will be more vul vulnerable as compared to a boy of the same age when it comes to a you know dream when it comes to dreaming about anything that they love and is the society still um, there when they even a girl of 11 years of age like loki or any other for that matter would think twice to pursue a dream which a boy would otherwise go ahead for absolutely i think um i think so many of these voices first it, it's amazing how quickly uh, we internalize certain things we internalize yes. throwaway comments that we hear by you know by friends by you know grown-ups adults uh, whoever they may be in your life. I think we're very, very quick to internalize some of those feelings. And whether we know it or whether we realize it or not, some of those uh, voices then kind of inform certain decisions that we make. And sometimes we're so quick to, even as adults, and I think it starts fairly young, but we're very quick to kind of shoot down our own dreams. Um, you know, for the longest time, before I started writing books for children, I would think, I, I wish I, I, should, I should try writing a book. And my own voice would say, no, 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 but you're you're not good enough or you shouldn't do that or do what you're doing already. And I think it's it's something that, you know, that happens. And I think for girls, especially uh, for young right. girls uh, who want to pursue certain paths, which till now uh, have traditionally not been seen as what they should be doing. And, you know, it's interesting because I get asked a lot, you know, but you wrote this book, but what about Mary Combe? And what about the Indian hockey team, mm -hmm. the women's hockey mm -hmm. team? And what about PV Sindhu? And I said, that's that's amazing. Yes, and these are role models and they're there and they're fantastic. But how many of us have gone and asked those? How many of us has gone, have gone and asked them, you know, what did you hear? What kind of voices did you hear that were telling you this is not what you should be doing? Um, and that doesn't mean that it's an easy path for all other young women who want to, for example, get into sports because these icons are there. I think it's still layered with a lot of... Um, disapproval you know and it's from it's from such uh, from something as simple as don't go and play sports you'll become so dark and then who will you marry who no one will want to marry you and we think nothing of saying this to 12 year old girls you know absolutely nothing at 12 yeah. marriage is and certainly should it's be the farthest thing from their mind <laughs> you know they're not worried about that um but we think nothing of saying these things to girls uh, and so I think we overrepeated all like, oh, you're going to wear such short shots and go and play. Like, what will people say? And, you know, even Loki comments on it because when she goes to Malteyaka's house, Malteyaka is in, you know, she yeah. says she's the only one over the age of eight who's, you know, eight. in our neighborhood who's a woman and wears shots, right? Um, yeah. So even she has internalized some of that messaging herself. So I do think that it is, it can be much harder for girls, um, you know, to, to want to be able to go out and do these things and feel like they can and feel like they can occupy that space and that they have every as much as a right to to do so as the boys they know. Definitely, ma'am. Um, there's one more question. There are more questions, but I think there's one more question that I had in mind, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the question that I actually had in mind after I finished reading the book and I thought that I'll just uh, 
I'll get the chance to ask from you about it. So uh, your book and the protagonist revolves around the game of cricket, which is purely an outdoor game. And I myself have been uh, an athlete when I was young, and I know uh, how liberating it is for our body and mind to practice a sport every day. So the world in which we're living today offers less opportunities for outdoor sport activities, you know, rather than indoor games. So um, as Lockie is herself an 11 year old, and so what is your take on the recent debate that we've uh, had going on, uh, going on, which is um, about practicing an outdoor game versus practicing technical courses like coding at such a tender age which is 11 and even lesser than that we have coding courses for uh, children now which who are 6 to 11 years of age so uh, especially when we know that their their holistic development is so important uh, throughout the journey and it's primary so uh, what's your take on this i i just wanted to know that uh, i think at you know i think there's so much research writing done about just how good uh sports are you know how good it is to go and play any kind of a physical activity whether it's just to you know you lace up your shoes and you go out for a run even as uh, from there to playing team sports um i think what's happened over the years as we raise you know parenting has now become you know a thing people do <laughs> you're not just a parent you have to do parenting as well you have like become a verb right and i think uh there's so much anxiety around the future success of our children you know are they all because you know there's this there's this feeling that there's a small kind of pie uh and that there are so many children who want a share of that in the future right and that success yeah. that idea of success and are our children going to be successful and that definition of success is hazy but it's also quite specific in the sense that it involves you know a certain number of degrees it involves a certain kind of job in a certain in certain industries uh, with a certain right. kind of remuneration attached to it right, and so right. parental anxiety is i think pushing us to almost you know see these it's are also the things our children should be there yeah, yeah it's transferred anxiety is transferred Yeah, yeah and their own aspirations and we also tie our own kind of sense of self worth and you know uh, as parents to the success of our children which are all which are, you know even now playing a sport parents encourage their children to play sports because it will help them get into university not exactly. or it will help them get a scholarship not because playing a sport is fun it teaches you so many life skills it teaches you so many life skills which are really important which are not coding which is not you know reading writing and arithmetic or any of those things but how to mm -hmm. how to play in a team how to involve others how to be you know a good leader a good team leader but at the same time you know play well with your teammates all of these things are so important and of course it's so good for our bodies for our mental health to be able to go out and play a sport but we've managed to take every fun thing for children from playing sports to even reading books reading for pleasure has now become something that parents want their children to pursue because it has some academic benefit to it not yeah, because it's a later a later benefit yeah yeah not because in that moment reading a book offers you so much joy and happiness so i think uh i i sympathize with the children who are being sent for coding classes at the age of 6 yeah. uh and i also sympathize with the parents who In, it's important uh, for our children sir. yes sir uh, yeah uh, this is about language again uh, i think sometimes for loki language is a is cathartic as well as a coping mechanism uh, if i may be permitted to ask you is it the same for you as a person oh yes absolutely Especially if you don't know i think uh, no i think uh, I I talk a lot. <laughs> you can ask anyone at home and my friends who know me well. Uh and I think for me writing is also um is also definitely a form of, you know, catharsis and to be able to and it's it's something I enjoy tremendously, but I think it also helps me kind of uh, that jumble and tangle of thoughts in my head. You know, uh some of them kind of become straightened out in certain books I write. Some of them are still tangled and jumbled up in my head. but absolutely it definitely is a form of release to be able to write lighter note uh, all the strong personalities in your book are women or ladies or girls and the guys are rather weak most of them and uh, except the naganathan character 
<laughs> so was that by that's design a, or it just came out? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I, you know, I think I kept wondering even after I'd written the book. It's true. It's true. It's all the women in the book are the ones with very strong personalities, both positive and and negative. And the uh, I I think I still question myself. Why did I make Loki's father so passive, so kind of uh, this? Uh, in his chair doing his own thing leading almost a separate life from his family like he has very little to to say almost right um i i have no answer for that i think but um but i think for me yeah i think maybe because i was possibly also surrounded by some very very strong women growing up uh both good and bad but i think we do have you know loki's brother finds his voice uh his own kind of ability to kind of speak up for himself based on his sister so he finds his way i think tambi uncle is uh you know also kind of tells her some truths drops truth bombs as the young people say today you know to loki when she goes to him but yeah, absolutely i think it's it's the women all the way who who do kind of carry this book that happy note i think we can call it a day today we've had some fascinating fascinating conversation with you the book was absolutely fun loving or fun filled rather and so was this conversation with you ma'am we had fun thank you so much and uh, we hope to look for a sequel where loki plays for the indian team <laughs> thank you so much thank you very much thank you very much thank, thank you. you thank you very much all of you thank you my request shavan sir to come up general shavan kumar sir put your hands together for general shavan kumar sir back sir wait sir 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 please sir yeah, we are getting having a no this is an nizam college yeah yeah please sir it would be nice so we want to thank uh, menaka raman ma'am and uh, manya thank you sir Mishra, miss manya thank mishra you. thank you very much manya thank you thank for you. having me sir thank you so much it was a lovely morning thank you <laughs> the two of you are okay fine ajay mishra sir on behalf of manya you can take the bag